In my 18 years as a professor, Eric Medina is the first and only student I've encountered who's double majoring in Latin American and Latino studies and ecology and evolutionary biology. The fourth year student and Mendocino native came to my attention in the summer of 2016 when he approached me about research opportunities for undergraduates at the CLRC. Via our undergraduate research apprenticeship program, he learned how social scientists identify and use data. With the support of a scholarship working to, ver to diversify the conservation field, he worked as a research assistant in a lab at Duke University last summer. Recently, he learned that he was awarded a Strauss Foundation scholar scholarship to revitalize the garden at Oaks College. He plans to transform the garden into a hub for food security on campus. Eric, yes. Woo. <laughs> Eric is an exceptionally nimble thinker who understands the basic building blocks of life and the social forces that enable and limit human agency. He's just as concerned with the health of our planet as he is with the conditions in which people labor. His research on Mexican artisan fisheries, which we'll be hearing about today, illustrates the importance of interdisciplinarity for understanding and improving our world. I'm very proud to present to you Eric Medina. Mexico is a globally important fishery. It is in the world's top producers of tilapia, sardines, tuna, shrimp, and squid, fish we are all acquainted with here in the United States. It has jurisdiction over one of the largest fishing sites in the world. This includes an exclusive economic zone that is over 5 million square kilometers. For perspective, that's half a million square kilometers larger than the entire European Union. Mexico also manages a significant number of freshwater bodies and lagoons. A significant, a significant part of Mexico's fish production is small scale, also called artisanal fisheries. To give you an idea, there are about 3,500 industrial vessels in Mexico, but over 100,000 small boats that are used in small scale fisheries. What separates small-scale fisheries from industrial fisheries is a few things. First, is that small-scale fish, small fisheries involve a low level of capital investment done by fishers. There's also a diversity of species being caught and gear being used by the fishers. Last, is that, that small-scale fishers have little power to influence the fish market. These characteristics lack the formal organization and resources that industrial fisheries have, making it difficult to regulate small-scale fisheries on a big scale. So they've long gone without governmental intervention. In 2013, a case study came out looking at how fishers self-organized in remote communities in Baja California Sur. What came out, was that, what came out of these studies was that through their own accord, Fishers had developed cooperative structures. These cooperatives came together largely so that fishers could, end, could be part of a fishery that had costs too high for a single individual to enter. The cost of entering a fishery include the gear used to fish, um, the cost of property rights, like permits, and the cost of transporting and selling fish once they've been caught. The benefits of these cooperatives are large. They allow fishers to democratically organize in an equally powered position. In fishing cooperatives, collective action is required to ensure members do not neglect their responsibilities. And fishers are included and held accountable on fishing permits. In effect, when small-scale fishers are part of a fishing cooperative, they are stakeholders in maintaining a fishery that is both ecologically and socially sustainable. 
However, in 1992, a reform to the permitting system in Mexico made it so that individuals outside of a cooperative structure could receive a fishing permit. This allowed for the, form this allowed for the formalization of the patron-client system, a situation where one individual with the means to do so <clears throat> can obtain a fishing permit and fishers will, can informally work underneath their permit. In the patron-client system, fishers are not equally powered to the permit holder, and fishers are often incentivized to, to use illegal fishing practices when permit holders assure them that they'll buy their fish regardless of the practices they use. Permit holders, or middlemen, are not tied to a specific marine ecosystem. They can roam freely, and so there's little incentive for them to encourage sustainable practices. You can, you can see how this model differs from the cooperative structures that fishers have developed. And all of this is not to tell you that the patron-client system is the issue. The issue I see, and that experts in Mexican fisheries see, is that there is a poor understanding and integration of the way small-scale fishers self-organize when managing fisheries in Mexico. The project I worked on this summer at Duke University aims to assess the successes and challenges that fishers experience being part of a cooperative structure. I looked at 17 focus groups done in six regions representative of Mexico's entire coastline. The focus groups included cooperative members from multiple states, and in these focus groups, fishers were asked a series of questions that included, what are the people from your region called? What fishing techniques and gear do you use? What are common problems in your region? What are some initiatives and solutions you have worked on? Using audio recorded in these focus groups, I analyzed and transcribed the responses of fishers. I found a series of elements that repeatedly came up, such as having proper documentation, having clear communication within and outside of co the cooperatives, having a diversity of species to fish for, and having cooperative members that are concerned with your quality of life. And although these may seem trivial, there are complex mechanisms at play that affect the success of self-governance in a region. One that I saw several times was the number of internal migrants in an area. In this situation, a high number of migrants led to poor understanding and distrust between fishers, making it hard for cooperatives to form and allowed for a patient-client system where migrants were willing to work for low wages and in dangerous situations because they could not enter a cooperative. This is one example that emphasizes our need to acknowledge, understand, and work with the way fishers self-govern. It is an issue that affects fishers' quality of life and our pursuit for an ecologically healthy world. Thank you.